Good morning. I know. Good morning. Good morning. So when the panels were being planned, I said, I want to be on one of the panels. <laughs> and this is the one that I wanted the most. <laughs> Uh, it's an amazing group of people talking about probably the issue that is the most existential. Um, what is our future? What is our safety? What is our security? I am going to briefly describe the backgrounds of our panelists because if I did full justice to it, they wouldn't have time to talk. Um, but I want to get to the questions at hand, and so I will start. They're not in order. Um, I have next to me Professor Gabriella Bloom, who is the Rita E. Hauser Professor of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law here at Harvard, and her specialties in public international law, international negotiation, law of armed conflict, and counterterrorism inform her writing and her teaching. Uh, she also co-directs an amazing project that the law school does with the Brookings Institution. It's a project on law and security. And she uh, has uh, brought to the law school her experience, seven years as senior legal advisor for the International Law Department of the Military Advocate General's Corps of the Israel Defense Forces. And she also served as a strategy advisor to the Israeli National Security Council a graduate of Tel Aviv University and of this law school with both an LLM and an SJD. Her books include one that, just think about the title, Islands of Agreement, Managing Enduring Armed Rivalries. But if you find an island of agreement, this actually has translation to your own personal life, even where nothing else is going on, find out an island of agreement. Uh, another great book, Laws, Outlaws and Terrorists, co-authored with Phil Hyman, uh, which won the Roy C. Palmer Civil Liberties Prize. And her next book is The Spider and the Mosaic, Technology and the Future of Violence, co-authored with Benjamin Wittes. Um, we have next to her is Naz, and I have to get, okay, Naz Modirzadeh, who is senior fellow for that project, the HLS Brookings Project on Law and Security here, and leads the Counterterrorism and Humanitarian Engagement Initiative. She also served on the faculty at the American University in Cairo and head, and head of its Human Rights Law Project. Um, and her outstanding work in the international humanitarian law field in the, human, in the Harvard Program on Humanitarian Policy and Conflict Research and at Human Rights Watch um, really enriches our community enormously. Uh, in addition to her degree from Harvard Law School, the class of 02, she holds a degree in political science from the University of California, Berkeley. And next to her, we have Jamie Gorelick. Now, Jamie could have been the sole member of the panel <laughs> my beautiful but unusual career. She could have done it all herself um, because her career has spanned the legal, corporate, and pol public policy landscapes. Uh, litigator at Wilmer Hale in Washington, she counsels leading organizations and individuals on regulatory matters and enforcement matters. That's what her um, public statement is. Basically, she fixes everything. Um, and she was the, one of the, she was one of the longest serving deputy attorney generals at the U.S. Department of Justice, also general counsel of the Defense Department, also assistant uh, to the secretary and counselor to the deputy secretary of energy. Uh, the commissions that she has served on include the 9-11 Commission, and she currently is a member of the Defense Policy Board. She's on the boards of United Technology Corporation, Amazon, Urban Institute, uh, president of the District of Columbia Bar in the past. She recently uh, finished her term as co-chair of the American Bar Association's Commission on Legal, Legal Ethics 2020. And um, thank you for being here. Um, uh, in the other direction, <coughs> we have Carol Rose, class of 96, who is the executive director of the ACLU of Massachusetts, which is, as we all know, a nonpartisan membership organization that uses litigation, legislation, and communications to promote civil rights and defend civil liberties. And this year, she launched a multi-million dollar initiative called Technology for Liberty to bring together technologists, lawyers, and academics to help ensure 21st century technology is used to promote liberty rather than to undermine it. 
Um, and her work as a lawyer is uh, complemented by her work as a journalist. She's been a national security analyst uh, for much of her life. Um, and we're really glad that she's here. I also can tell you that her blog on Liberty is available and you can check it out. Um, she also has children who apparently question authority repeatedly. Is that right? <laughs> um, uh, and then we have Juliette Kayem, class of 95, who's been uh, a public safety and public service uh, expert uh, nationally uh, and in the state government. Uh, at this moment, she is candidate for governor of Massachusetts. Woo! Oh, I'm nonpartisan. Nonpartisan. Um, <laughs> Why am I here then? No. <laughs> Massachusetts uh, has yet to elect a woman as governor, so um, that's why I'm applauding here. No, no. Um, uh, and most recently, uh, Juliet served um, on, uh, for President Obama as Assistant Secretary for Intergovernmental Affairs at the Department of Homeland Security. And previously, she served Governor Deval Patrick's Homeland Security Advisor and legal advisor to uh, U.S. Attorney General Janet Reno in the past. She's an author of uh, many, many books and articles. And, you know, this is Juliet. She, she's asked by the Boston Globe, would you write a column for us? So she does. And in her first year, she's a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Um, uh, she's also taught at the Kennedy School, a uh, graduate of the college and the law school. She's married to David Barron, just nominated to become um, uh, a judge on the First Circuit. And they have three children, um, and I don't know if they question authority. I'm not so <laughs> sure about that. And then we are so honored to have Jane Harmon, class of 69, uh, Jane Harmon, uh, I think everybody knows Jane Harmon, but I, anyway, I'm going to give my version of her, her bio. She represented uh, California District, uh, the Aerospace Center, for nine terms in Congress. And there she became the go-to person on, uh, on national security, the Armed Services Committee, Intelligence Committee, Homeland Security. Uh, her fact-finding missions to hotspots around the world, uh, every single one of them, uh, North Korea, Syria, Libya, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Guantanamo Bay, she is, uh, her expertise is so deep and her wisdom is so broad. She had the guts to leave Congress, although very, very popular in 2011, to become the first female director, president, and CEO of the Woodrow Wilson Center, which is a marvelous center for thinking and independent uh, analysis on uh, important range of issues. Her many, many awards include the Defense Department Medal for Distinguished Service, the CIA SEAL Medal. I can go on and on, but she doesn't want me to, so I won't. Um, she has uh, four adult children, four grandchildren. They never question authority. Um, and we are now going to start uh, with our discussion. So when I sent questions out to the panel, I thought we'd talk about Syria. Everything's changed from when I sent the questions out. But nonetheless, I am going to ask something about Syria. How, how much of a threat to American national security is the situation in Syria? And how much have we um, increased that threat through the conduct of the United States in the last couple of months? Anybody want to answer that? Well, as a recovering politician, I guess I ought to try this. Uh, my version is I escaped from the asylum just in time, and I watch with dismay as many friends in both parties are struggling to provide any, any semblance of leadership for our country. It's really dismal. Uh, Syria is not the same kind of threat to our national security as Iran is. Uh, nuclear weapons in Iran uh, poised at Israel or other places are uh, a direct security threat to the United States. And by the way, I think the news on Iran today is absolutely thrilling. Hopefully that will amount to something. The Syrian case is, is more indirect, and I don't think the uh, administration made it well, which was one of the reasons that Congress ran away from the issue. The other reason was that there is enormous war fatigue in the country, uh, and people out there think, why can't I have a job? Why is my government perhaps closing? And why isn't that more important than a third war in a, in a Muslim country? At any rate, the threat that Syria poses to us 
is, first of all, that chemical weapons could get in the wrong hands, and for 100 years there has been an agreement, even though it was bridged by Saddam Hussein, that chemical weapons should never be used again. That's one threat. The second threat is that Syria gone wrong uh, emboldens Iran, and if you think Iran is a real threat, then Syria is a threat. And finally, uh, terror groups like Hezbollah, uh, which, uh, are, which operate out of, from Iran uh, through Syria to, Lib to uh, uh, Lebanon, uh, Juliet, I'm sure, knows tons about this, uh, pose a, they do pose a direct threat to Israel, and they have international reach uh, in the 90s. Uh, they were able to mount attacks in Buenos Aires, among other places. Thank you. Professor Blum. So on top of all of that, I think the issue with Syria is not just Syria itself, but Syria is a case study, a case study for conflicts around the world uh, that whether the United States likes it or not, now invariably affect it. So being the world's leading superpower, uh, anything that happens anywhere around the world has a direct bearing on the United States. And Americans don't like to think about playing the role of the world's police officer, but they have to, uh, whether they like it or not. And it's not clear what that means at every possible junction. But the leadership of the United States was tested this time. And the United States can now, or is trying to tell a tale of victory that the threat or very amorphous and unbacked threat of force is what allowed this agreement to happen. But that's a difficult story to tell. And when we think about Syria, we not only need to think about the specific case of Syria and Hezbollah and, and Iran and that region, but also how it affects the United States resolve or the United States willingness or the United States leadership in taking a stance on conflicts essentially anywhere around the world. Thank you. Juliet. Uh, so I, um, when I was doing the column, I went to the Syrian-Jordanian border, and so I talk about the other Syria, which is all the refugees, which is probably about 1.5 to 2. No, the numbers are just not clear. And it seems to me, if you think of Syria a threat, um, the, I agree uh, that the Syria itself, Syria in terms of the geography, is probably a different kind of threat than the other Syria, which is uh, just an entire, you know, population of people who are living in hell, essentially, um, and are destabilizing the countries that they are in. So the, the conflicts and the unrest in Lebanon, and then you worry about Jordan, and then whatever we think of the Saudis, and whatever we think of these countries that um, are, are hardly models of democracy, uh, they are ours. And, the, um, and so their instability, I think, is probably the 10 or 20 year factor, what are we going to do with all the Syrians, because they're not going back to Syria. Um, and then you start to worry about Israel as well, because uh, if you, you know, I, when I was driving in Jordan, it's just a, you know, you just, you just can't fathom, you know, a million people in a refugee camp in a country that's not going to have an impact on a monarch who is trying to be more liberal, uh, but he's still a monarch, right? So that to me is sort of the long-term fear too. You know, the little work that I've done in the refugee world suggests that the nature of current conflicts it has um, it is the, this impact on displaced populations uh, across borders, destabilizing then the countries that are nearby, uh, the burdens on the uh, economies, but also the burdens um, really on tolerance, um, which we actually see now all over Europe. I think that Europe's um, becoming reactionary in various ways in reaction to the people who have moved to Europe. So, Jamie. I'd actually like to pose a question, which is how important is it if the president articulates a red line and another country or body goes over it that we back up that inherent threat, that explicit or implicit threat? What role should that, should that play in our foreign policy and our national security approach? It's a really fabulous question with just this addendum. If we establish a red line and then we don't back it up, what happens? So who wants that one? Carol? Oh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> well, to answer that a little bit um, and to answer the first question as well, it seems to me that one of the big lessons that I think that Syria can teach us as well as other conflicts around the world is that we can't really fight our way uh, with pure military force 
to solve these problems around the world, policemen or not. Um, and in fact, we need to restore the rule of law in all of our uh, work in diplomacy. And I think it isn't a sign of weakness, but rather a sign of strength when we do so. And I think the fact that the president decided to go to Congress uh, and to seek their approval, their authorization before moving forward was important not merely as a matter of law, but also as a matter of buying some time in terms of letting things play out diplomatically. So I think it's important not just to look at the red line and the use of military force in isolation from the foreign policy goals. After all, you know, war is really a tool of diplomacy, and we have to make sure that diplomacy is there as well as the rule of law and not merely the threat of force if we Can want I, this to actually be effective. L let me push you on that a little bit. So if you're in Iran and you're if, if we can roll back the clock a little bit and not take our current posture with Iran as a given. But let's just say they're still threatening to develop a nuclear weapon. And we have said that's unacceptable mm -hmm. and we will not tolerate it without saying what we would do. And then let's just say that we also say if you use chemical weapons in Syria, that is not tolerable. We're not gonna tell you what we're gonna do, but it is not tolerable and then you don't do anything to back up the latter <clears throat> red line. What implication is there in Iran for that? Well, I mean, I think you make a good point that go, ultimatums aren't a particularly effective diplomatic tool. There's no, I would agree with you on that in terms of the premise of your question. But at the same time, I think it's really important to understand uh, that at a time when we did take a step back and when we did start a larger international and national dialogue about whether or not this was the right step, it created breathing space so that in fact, uh, Russia and then Iran and others, there has been more diplomacy as a result than I think there would have been had we merely gone in and done a very, what was it that John Kerry said, hyper-limited Let me strike. ask one more follow-up. So if we hadn't, uh, if, if, if we hadn't threatened uh, Syria, would Syria and the Russians have done what they did? Or sanctions on Iran. Yeah. Well, sanctions on Iran, but sanctions are a, a non-military sure, option. option. But they're a course of action. Course of I action. was just going to say, Martha introduced this about all of our kids who question authority. How many of us, certainly I'm one, have said, if you do this, <laughs> then you can't have that, and then backed off. And it's, <laughs> am I the only one? Oh, come on. Come on. All right, so uh, two comments. Number one, However we got there, which was kind of a mess, I think we're in a much better place than we were. That's, that's number one. And two, I, just a simple little proposal, we ought to abolish the term red line. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's very, uh, I think it's really helpful. You know, we can, we can rehash the series of stumbles and mistakes uh, that have been uh, really the president and uh, the people surrounding him. Um, but it is also very fascinating how, you know, a misstatement by the Secretary of State seemed to create an opening uh, that maybe we should have just a little more testing the water and see if people are willing to, to, to broaden the variety of options here. Um, and Samantha Power, our graduate, uh, has been at the center of this uh, negotiation that seems to have gone remarkably well. Um, so and far. so far, so far, so far. Uh, I want to put a question, though, about that. Advice to Samantha. So um, he, here's the question. You know, she's trying to walk this very careful line of saying, well, we, there's something promising here. We might be able to come up with an accord, an agreement, um, but um, we don't believe them. We don't believe Syria. And so is the advice, you know, pretend to believe them, even if it's not credible, because that's, boy, an exit option for the United States from what had been a terrible situation and a real risk of war. Um, uh, or just kind of set some markers, no red lines, but some markers that somebody external would say, well, that's some sign of credibility. Forget credibility, just go with the deal. How many of us in our lives have said, well, you know, let's just let everybody save face, even if we don't believe it? No, I, I would, I'll answer it as the non-candidate. No, I, I think it's, uh, I, I, I think um, the first. 
And the reason, what's our goal? Our goal is that people don't die from chemical weapons. That we have avoided again. We didn't get it the first time. Um, and there are questions about how much Assad knew was going on. And so that's a whole separate story. Um, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, no, 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 no. But I'm saying, I'm just saying, the, our goal is, we have one goal, which is chemical weapons are not used as a uh, weapon in Syria or anywhere else. And I think that the deal is remarkable in that regard. And then you come in later and you say, uh, uh, it, if there's evidence that it's being used and you have verification, uh, uh, then you, uh, you don't use red lines, but you have other mechanisms to stop Syria. But I, I feel like that deal that they signed uh, is pretty uh, incredible in the one primary goal we have, which is more no more Syrians I, die I, from chemical weapons. I don't think that's our one goal. Okay. I think our real goal there is to move Bashar out. And I think this sets up Geneva too in a way that could achieve a transitional government which would serve the interest of the neighbors, even the, the bad neighbors, Russia and Iran, but also our interests. And sure, uh, containing and hopefully destroying the chemical weapons are part of that, and, and sending the world a message about chemical weapons is part of that. Uh, but I was going to say about Samantha and what she's saying, um, this may shock everybody, but again, as a recovering politician, mm -hmm. sometimes people say things that are not what they really mean, and <laughs> aren't you shocked? Have you never done it? So uh, she had, she's, she's uh, communicating with two different publics with the UN public and the, and the Syrians and others, and then she's communicating with the American public. And she has to keep that, that edge and that toughness until there really is something that they have to sell. And right at the moment, they have promised, but they, don't, they, they haven't done the deal. Nas, Nas. yeah, so I think, I mean, I think this is probably particularly a problem for someone like Samantha, who has for so many years called upon us to think about national security, not just as a domestic US question of national security, but as a question of the security of others in other places, right? A more empathetic national security, if you will. I think, I wish that Juliet's articulation of our goal was right. I don't think that's our goal. Um, I think it is not that people don't die. Maybe it's that people don't die from chemical weapons, but it's important to remember over 100,000 people have died from conventional weapons in this conflict. Um, I spend most of my time and I've spent most of my career working with humanitarian aid workers and human rights actors, and most of my friends and colleagues, uh, for them, this is the conflict of the generation. This is a conflict that will forever reshape the Middle East. And I think it's, it's critical we remember that, but I think it's also important that we keep in mind um, that the, the real question, I think, is uh, how do we define national security, right? Is national security merely a question of the direct, immediate threats to the United States? If the answer to that question is yes, then uh, articulating our goals in Syria becomes, I think, uh, much more difficult. Um, if we define national security in a broader sense, if we define national security as long-term questions of what happens if, for example, the Islamic State in Syria, a virulent branch of Al-Qaeda, were to come to greater territorial power in that country on the border with Turkey, what does that look like in 10 years? Um, so I think that for Samantha, I, I don't have advice to her, I, I wouldn't presume, but I would say um, it, it really is a question of how does she align the national security that she has uh, backed for so long, the vision of national security, with the challenges of her current position. So I occasionally teach her international negotiations and uh, two things that I try to teach my students. One is to just echo what Jane said. I tell them that there's nothing pinker than red lines. So when you sort of prepare for a negotiation, you think what's your ultimate red line, you can call it that, keep it in mind, but you may discover throughout the negotiation that it becomes incredibly sort of shades of pink. That doesn't resolve the question of whether 
I'm, I'm not sure I agree uh, with Carol that ultimatums are never a useful tool of diplomacy. I think they're sometimes inevitable. They are a necessary tool, and you do have to consider what happens when you, when you then uh, retract from them. So that's one point. The other point is that whether something is successful or not, whether we achieved victory or not, is often uh, as much about narrative as it is about the thing itself. And the thing about this current resolution or the agreement is that it allowed both sides, Russia and the United States, to claim victory. Russia, because there is no military operation and they kept get to keep their alliance with, uh, with uh, Syria. Putin addresses the American people. He becomes the real dove in this story, <laughs> remarkably. Uh, and Americans can say, look, for the first time we achieved a resolution on Syria, which we haven't managed to do for the previous uh, year, year and a half, and we're uh, attempting some degree of control over the chemical weapons. Um, but of course, it's as much about deferring the problem as it is about resolving it. And uh, what, the res what this agreement mainly did was buy time. Uh, and sort of in a, in a space where there was no international resolve and no domestic resolve to use any alternative means, uh, we all very much hope it would work. There are bound to be numerous debates over whether this agreement is complied with or not. I'll tell you that right now, there will be no agreement over whether the Syrians are actually complying or not. There'll be lots of opportunities to say they're not complying. Uh, and the, the question will inevitably become a later down the road, what do you do about that? Yeah. Okay. One more comment or two more comments on Syria and then we're going to move on. Um, Jane, do you have any? Well, just the, there's a context here. And uh, John Kerry calls diplomacy a dance. And, and in many ways, I think that's true. Making legislation is making sausage, but it's also a dance. And, and things keep changing, and the rhythm keeps changing. And you have to see Syria in the context of Iran and in the context of the peace process. The same players are circling all this, and there, there is an opportunity. I agree with, with everything you just said, by the way. Um, but there is an opportunity, if Syria is trending in a good direction, to also then factor in uh, if, if Iran is invited, and I think it should be, to the, to the Geneva II table, there's Iran sitting right there. Then you talk about Iran's interest in Syria, our interest in Iran, and there are all these side conversations. And I don't think there will be a grand bargain, meaning on one day all of this is arranged. But if you think of a dance, this really could, could. I'm, I'm an optimist, otherwise why would I have spent 17 years in Congress? Uh, this really could end up with so many more... Uh, I see everybody nodding, that's a good thing. Uh, with so many more achievements for the US in a role we need to play in the world than anything else might have. You know, President Obama, if he has a signature foreign policy, I'm not sure he has a, I'm not gonna finish the sentence, but if he has a signature element of his foreign policy, it's not go alone, it's not unilateralism. And that's where I think he got in trouble here because it started to look like going alone. Is his mission of trying to build a sense of coalition, if not international, consensus approaches to uh, peace and security, is that advanced now? Are we more on that front? Yeah. Is the, it looks like it to me. It looks yeah. like the, uh, both the UN and other kinds of structures are strengthened by this. But there is a question about the respect for the United States, and is it diminished? It's a, it's a, it's a trade-off. I mean, a lot of people would have liked the president to take quick action in Syria, and then everyone would say tisk tisk, including his former self would have said tisk tisk, <laughs> right. and um, and it would be done, and it's ever been thus. Right. Now, given what's happened in Syria, th that would not have been that would not have been the preferred optimal. and better yeah. optimal approach. But it is what we do, and we do it because you, you, you're actually not going to get um, the, either the appearance or actual actuality of strength in the moment by having a big debate in Congress. I mean, you're just not. It's, ne it ne it's never going to happen. The, the one bookmark I would like to put on this conversation, as we talk about Syria and Iran, when you get to one of your last questions, which is what is the role of lawyers, 
These sanctions have worked. The Iran sanctions, uh, people said, oh, it's silly, it's at the margins, it's not really affecting anyone. It changed the reality on the ground in Iran. And, um, uh, you know, I know you want to get to this later, but I, at this moment in the conversation where we're talking about big tectonic shifts yeah. in the Middle East, and particularly in Iran, you, you have to recognize the power of the sanctions. Uh, we can go there right now. You know, I, I think that the uh, Department of Treasury's approach uh, in tracing the money uh, has been a very powerful one. I, I'd be interested in people's views about the role of lawyers in uh, national policy, uh, foreign policy, um, na national security and foreign policy. Are, does, does legal training and legal tools, do legal training and legal tools well, make let, a let difference? Let me just start off with this one. The sanctions program was the creature of lawyers. Yeah. They looked at the problem of money and other goods enabling terrorism, enabling terrorist states, and they said, what tools are in our tool chest, either domestically or internationally, to stop this? They, quiet, they quietly put regimes in place uh, where they needed congressional action, they got it. They quietly negotiated with, you know, between 20 and 50 states, depending on the nature of the sanction, and they persistently ratcheted it up. And when a bad thing happened, like an event of some sort, a terrorist event of some sort that enabled them to um, look to see what kinds of resources the bad actors needed, they used the intelligence tools that were available to us to see what resources the bad guys needed, and they worked methodically to take them away. It was lawyers who were thoughtful and strategic and patient that, in my view, got us where we are today. Any other Can lawyer I, comments? Well, I just, just to, on a specific about what Jamie's talking about, um, so 10 months ago, the biggest, because I'm obsessed with transportation and infrastructure, the biggest shipping company in the world called Merck uh, finally said, it's just cost too much to deliver to Iran. Um, and I think the consequences of the next 10 months, it's sort of this untold story. So they stopped shipping, which is, was how Iranians survived, was it that they were the last German, they were the last company. Um, and it was because of the sanctions. And then I think if you take that moment when they stopped shipping um, and backtrack it, uh, it's important. And then on the, on just quickly on the Obama thing, I actually, can we just start from the beginning on the bilateral, you know, what Obama is? Obama's actual signature reason, I mean, national security agenda was to end two wars. And let's not, and that was very unilateral. And let's not forget that because if we, we have to remember 2000, and eight in the context of what, why was he elected president? And he did so. And you have a lot of complaints about Iraq and Afghanistan, but just all of this is in the context of, um, of that promise which he delivered on, which had, for a lot of us in this room, we don't feel it, but for those of us who deal with the military a lot, we do, million, Two million veterans, a million people servicing in the war. It's like, so, so the context of 2013, or 2013, is that the year in? It has to be viewed in the moment of what I think is actually his signature foreign policy, which is not going to be Syria and Libya and all this stuff. It is going to be the ending of two wars, which um, I think a lot of us are grateful for. Naz, you want to say something about sanctions? Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to say, I think that we need to be very careful about causality on the sanctions. I think it's, it's, it's early days, right? The first phone call between a U.S. president and an Iranian president happened within the last 24 hours um, since uh, 34 years ago. Um, so I think that it's easy to say sanctions worked. That's, that's what did this, that's what moved Iran, maybe. But I think there's going to be and should be tremendous debate about that in the weeks and months to come. I do think, and there's a great new book on this by an HLS-affiliated faculty, um, Juan Zarate, on Treasury's War on the graduate. Development. And graduate, and graduate indeed. <laughs> Not a woman, but uh, nonetheless, a very important book. And, um, and I think that the, there has been an 
Thank you. Unbelievable expansion of the bureaucracy, administration, and infrastructure dealing with terrorism, counterterrorism, and sanctions in the U.S. government. And uh, there are good outcomes and there are bad outcomes. And I think it's just important to keep in mind when we talk about this that the sanctions policy, not only in Iran, but in many other places, has also had an incredible human cost. And there have also been uh, effects of the sanctions that government officials themselves recognize are the result of overreach of sanctions, hitting too hard, um, defining too broadly what we want to keep from not just the governments, but of course the individuals, the human beings living in many of these countries and places. So I just wanted to keep Jane, that in thank mind. Thank you, Jane. Well, just if you, I, I actually agree with that, that comment. The intelligence shows that the sanctions have worked very well. However, a lot of people in Iran are suffering and the middle class in Iran has basically been destroyed. So if you look for a way forward, and you just have uh, the, the, the very disadvantaged in Iran and then a strong leadership cadre, it, it doesn't look good yeah. for pluralist democracy in Iran. So that, that is a byproduct. But, but they voted for Rouhani. Now, Rouhani may not be the answer. He may not be what he has promised, but they voted. I, well, I agree with Always that. Vote. that I mean, it has a, Iran has a very, very high voting participation. Yeah, they, for, they did vote they for vote him. for somebody to talk to the president. No, but the slate was basically pre-approved pre yeah. by the Supreme Leader, and it, we have yet to see okay. whether what Rouhani is saying uh, will, will yeah. be achieved. I just want to say one other, th two more things. One about legal training. It's hugely useful for policy making, just enormously useful, especially if one attended Harvard Law School. I'm sure Ma Martha wanted that <laughs> plug in there. Um, I have certainly found that. But on the sanctions, Congress is poised, if that is, if, if Congress lasts another couple weeks and <laughs> there is a government, uh, to pass an even stronger sanctions bill. Did you know? Yeah, yeah. And does that make sense in the context of this diplomacy uh, that's going on? It actually might, if you think about it, wow. Uh, the, the, the kind of cross pressures here. If, if Congress is poised to be tougher and if the sanctions are having an effect on the re Iranian government, which we believe they are, uh, Congress doing this thing, it's kind of a threat, uh, might help us achieve diplomatic goals. Carol, did you want to come in? Yeah, on a couple things. First, on the sanctions question, I think it's very troubling because I think that it's true that they can cause uh, tremendous suffering and so they have to be applied uh, with a nuance, as all these things do. Um, but I will say that once, uh, during the apartheid era, I had the opportunity to uh, interview Desmond Tutu and I asked him about the suffering caused by sanctions there. And he said, we are suffering anyway. Let it not be in vain. Um, and I thought that was a very interesting, uh, a very interesting point. Um, with regard to the, the larger questions about the role of law and lawyers and also uh, the notion that, uh, that, that Professor Bloom mentioned about the narrative, I think lawyers play a tremendously important role uh, in creating different tools in the toolbox as well as in shaping the narrative of the U.S. foreign policy. Um, I think that when the United States is seen as uh, a leader of the world that upholds the rule of law, I think it strengthens our hand in diplomacy, both at home but in particular in these other countries. I think that when we're seen as a country that doesn't comply with the rule of law, it undermines our credibility. Uh, and I think it's terribly important that we keep that in mind. Um, and just to blow it open a little bit, uh, while it's true that President Obama has, in fact, uh, brought down uh, two wars, uh, he's dramatically increased the amount of covert uh, operations in many, many countries uh, where, in oh, fact, so much so that the battlefield has, in fact, become somewhat worldwide uh, without any geographic limits and without any uh, time limits whatsoever. And I think this is a real concern in terms of the rule of law and the narrative in these countries. As someone who lived among the Pashtuns for a number of years, uh, I do have an understanding of some of the kinship and some of the code of revenge and things like that, and what Professor Blum has referred to as a hydra effect. Um, while you can use covert operations occasionally to take out the heads of some of these uh, organizations, you end up having whole clans 
rising up against you. And I think if we look at the U.S. policy uh, in Somalia, in Yemen, in Pakistan, and some of these places where we don't have declared wars, uh, we can begin to see the potential dangers of having a covert foreign policy uh, that arguably is in violation of both international and domestic law. So my mental note was by 10 o'clock we're going to be on surveillance. But So we're one more minute, and, and in that one minute, um, Gabby Bloom is going to say something about legal education. So why is it that lawyers are so useful in um, discussing these things or thinking about them? And you actually have this panel as kind of the example mm -hmm. of how multifaceted and complex and uh, multidimensional all these questions are. And I think this is what we're trying to do. It's not that lawyers have a monopoly over wisdom. It is that we train, when we train here students, what we try to do is uh, make them think not about law, but about the law in action. And it means considering social and cultural and political and economic and strategic uh, effects of any decision, uh, any legal decision, any legal dimensions of policies. And this is what allows for this very sort of broad thinking about strategy much more uh, in a much more um, broader scope. And I'll say one more word, and this is uh, Martha's doing, uh, even before she became dean, was to introduce the international law a component into the curriculum. And I think um, this is especially an especially important role for those who are trained in international law and are involved in the policy decision making, exactly to bring this foreign viewpoint into the discussion that uh, to make sure that, yes, we think about America and the biggest superpower and we're very strong and very big, but there are approximately 200 other countries out there that may see things a little bit differently. And yes, they need to be taken into account too. And I think uh, it's been a tremendous contribution to the education of our students to, uh, uh, as they train as lawyers, to remember that it can't only be an internal discussion and it has to take into account these uh, broader global perspectives. I didn't know you were going to say that. That's really great. Uh, so in, in, case, in case anyone doesn't know, we now require every first year student in the JD program to take a course from a set of options that basically are international or comparative law and uh, demonstrate that the United States is but one jurisdiction and that institutions, culture, uh, and sources of law that are multiple um, will govern their lives forever. Uh, and it is a disorienting experience for many of them. Uh, and it's just what we had hoped. As the student body itself becomes more diverse, over 11% of the current JD class is uh, not US citizens, um, it's a crucial. It's crucial that we do this, not to mention everybody is global every day, and so we better be aware of it. Which makes the transition to surveillance and cyber all the more relevant. Um, country. <laughs> well, it, 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 I, I don't even know how to, how to disentangle the different elements here, but I'll just name a couple and then I want everybody on the panel to give comments about what are the, um, the biggest risks and what are the approaches that this country or multilateral groups can tackle to try to deal with those risks. So just a couple. One is the covert wars that Carol has already put on the table um, with its danger to democracy. Um, uh, we have no accountability if it's covert. Uh, uh, a second uh, is the surveillance uh, inside this United States, which also has a secrecy dimension, whether it's the FISA court or even things we don't know. A third is um, the fact that every institution with which I'm affiliated now is reporting cyber attacks, um, and the cost of actually even identifying them is extraordinary, not to mention trying to come up with some kind of a protective approach, which no one says is possible. Everyone says, well, just get used to it. We're all going to be attacked. And you didn't know that the last 15 years, all of your data has been uh, stolen and, and collected by uh, foreign entities and maybe competitors inside the United States, but it is going on and get used to it. Uh, what, so that's another one. Um, and, and a fourth one uh, is the degree to which individuals have their own sense of self altered by these shifts, which then affects how much people even desire or press for liberty, privacy, 
Um, I don't know how many of you have talked to anyone under 20 recently, um, but if you talk to people about, you know, do you, do you care about your privacy settings in your Facebook account and do you know that you don't have control over the default settings, they are constantly shifting, the numbers of people who say to me, well, whatever, um, is so large. And so this shift in the sense of self and entitlement and therefore demand for, no, I want something different, so much has happened in the private sector. It's not the government. It's the commercial world. And so the limits of our tools in addressing this really stand out for me. Unless we have legislation, as Europe does much more, people give away. They just give away. You know, I click through, and therefore I've given away my privacy over and over and over again. So those are the four that I have. Mm -hmm. Who wants to take this up? Jane. Well, on uh, covert wars, um, it, 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 you bias the issue when you say wars. Yeah. I think we need covert capability, but I do think the CIA should get out of the business of being a paramilitary op organization. And uh, to the extent we use drones, which should be a, uh, a reduced use of drones, uh, they do create a backlash or a boomerang effect. Uh, those drones or other things should be run out of the Pentagon. Which, is, which should be in that business and subject to clear rules. So can you explain okay. what difference that would make? What, if, if it's not CIA, if it is the Pentagon, in terms of uh, accountability, reporting to Congress, what difference would that make? Well, it comes on, on a different budget line, but that's not the important part. The important part is uh, then the use of drones is a military operation, and it does get into tricky issues. I'm sure Jamie will say this in a minute. I just wanted to tick off your other things. Yes. That, that using drones in certain circumstances would then constitute an act of war, which it doesn't if they're used under the CIA's uh, covert authorities. But at any rate, I think we should keep covert authorities, but war making should be in the Pentagon, uh, and Congress should be fully informed. Um, not that Congress is always capable of doing anything with that information, but Congress should be fully informed. On surveillance, um, it's a, it'll take much longer than this to talk about it, but I was there. Um, I was there in 1978. You, maybe you forgot. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act was enacted in 1978 in response to the abuses of the Nixon administration and, and to the recommendations of the uh, Church Committee. And FISA uh, performed very well until 9-11 when, one, the, the antiquated authorities became clear, not to me personally, not for a while, but certainly to the Bush White House. I'm not defending the Bush White House because I disagree with what they did, but what they did do was they invented a much more robust program outside of FISA. Uh, I was in the so-called Gang of Eight at the time who, were, who was briefed on, on their program um, in, a, in a very secret setting. That was because I was the ranking Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee. Uh, but they kept saying it fully complies with law, but they forgot to say it doesn't comply with FISA. We're using Article II Commander-in-Chief authorities. And then ultimately, Congress, when we found out, amended FISA, and we can talk about that longer. But I think the system has built-in checks and balances. Could it be constrained, narrower, more transparent? Yes. But I think we need a system. On cyber, huge threat, unbelievably big, and we are very ill-equipped. We're doing okay protecting the, the dot .mil and the dot .gov space, but the dot .com space, the private space, is essentially unprotected, and not only are our, is our intellectual property being stolen, but everything, all, your, your private life is basically gone. And last comment about your point, Martha, about the younger generation. Uh, it, we really have to have the conversation around what to do with the younger generation. Their expectations are completely different. I, I, I don't think it's particularly realistic to think that what you do in, 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 in the public space can ever be protected again. The use of cameras, let alone everything else, has compromised that. Um, but in private space, if we don't act soon, that will be gone too. I mean, for, to me, uh, permitting the use of drones over the US uh, in private hands or even in law enforcement hands, Juliet may disagree, is opening a slippery slope that will shred our Fourth Amendment. And I think it is highly dangerous, and I think very soon we need to get to a public debate about that. Thank you. Martha? Um, yeah, Jamie. I, I think you've put so many questions on the table at once that it's a little hard to digest right. them. No, no, it, but they all do relate to each other, so I understand why you did it. I, I would like to... 
kind of take the, speaking of drones, take the conversation up to maybe 37,000 feet a little <laughs> bit. Um, as Jane said, we've had pretty much for the history of our country, but if you just going back to 1978, uh, a set of pendulum yeah. swings between security and liberty. And <clears throat> the, for anybody who cares about liberty, what you don't want is the moment after we feel insecure. So I can tell you in the moment after the Oklahoma City bombing and in the moments after the 9-11 attacks, the fear took over and we produced the Anti-Terrorism Act of 1995 where we passed, Congress passed everything that it had just a year ago, a year before rejected. And in the Patriot Act, the same thing. The, 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 all, the reason the Patriot Act was passed so quickly is because it was in the drawer. And it was just taken out of the drawer after the attack. So if you care about civil liberties, what you want is, in, for whatever other reason you might want it, is to have sufficient security so you don't have that moment. So we're in that pendulum swing again. So we had the church committee in 1978, and we, we adopted FISA, and that was good, as Jane said, until 9-11, and then people started to see some of the consequences of the divide between domestic law enforcement and international intelligence that produced some of the seams that the terrorists went through. Um, so now we have Snowden, and both because of what he's revealed and because of the misinformation about what he's revealed, there is an impulse to say, well, we shouldn't be doing surveillance. But surveillance is actually in an asymmetric war, which is what mm -hmm. counterterrorism is, our, our, our most important tool. So if you can prevent Boston Marathon bombings um, by gathering intelligence, in a lawful and appropriate way, that's a good thing. So if we throw all of that out in the name of liberty, we're actually, in my longer term prediction, gonna have less of it. So the critical thing for us to do is to take a deep breath and literally understand what we're doing and why we're doing it and whether there are more appropriate protections, whether they be transparency or oversight, that will balance those concepts appropriately. I think a very good st step last week was the publication by the FISA court for the very first time of its entire analysis for the obtaining of, for the obtaining of, uh, of telephone records, which with very limited and controlled procedures can be tapped into in counterterrorism investigations. But we now have you know, the rationale, and we can look at it, and we can say, is this a good rationale or a bad rationale? Do we need to change it? That's a very good thing to do. I would only want to make one other point, which is that it is, I think it is a mistake for us, though it's obviously relevant to discuss it, to conflate what we're willing to give up in the commercial space with what we're willing to give up to the government in the way of our information. It is true and there's, that we click through and we don't really know what we're giving up, but it's a different sensibility and a different set of problems when you make a trade with a Google or a Facebook that they get your information and you get a service you like for free than if you give up information that the government could use in a punitive fashion. And I think while it's important to understand kind of our mindset, Analytically, these are two very different things, and they have been since the formation of our Constitution. Well, I, 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 I think that's incredibly helpful and insightful. There's just this problem, which is the government buys the data sets from the commercial entities. And so the click-through says, by the way, we may sell this. Right. So that crucial line no longer exists. Yeah, but I think, let me just say one other thing, and then I'll pass the mic. I, I think the things that people are mostly worried about are the govern are governmental actions that the commercial sector can't take. So I think we're gonna go down the line. If Carol goes first. Uh, 
yeah, I'll try to be brief because I know we're short on time. Um, Couple things first. I think it's important to understand that uh, secrecy is as much a problem and, per, and very much related to surveillance. So, as in a democracy, when the government increases its power to watch its people while diminishing the power of the people to watch the government, we've really flipped democracy on its head. I also think it's important to understand that um, privacy isn't about secrecy. Privacy is about control of the information that's out there about you. And in fact, polls have shown that all Americans, but in particular young Americans, care very much about protecting their privacy. Um, and we're certainly seeing that in terms of uh, the ACLU membership going up. The other thing I want to say is I think it's important to understand that surveillance doesn't keep us safe and in fact often has the opposite effect. Um, just for example, with the Boston Marathon bomber, um, two things happened that could have potentially been prevented. One is the fact that there in fact were, was intelligence information uh, from the Russians to our government saying that they should take a look at Tamerlane Tsarnaev, the elder brother of the two alleged bombers. And they missed that. Why? Because there was so much information going on. And in fact, at that very time that that information was coming in, the Boston Police Department and the state police were very busy spying on Veterans for Peace um, and their peace protests because, gee, surveillance is in. Uh, the second thing that I would say with regard to that that could have happened, uh, on 9-11, the 10th anniversary, there was a triple homicide that was never solved. After the bombing, it was linked to, in fact, the older brother and, a, and another guy named uh, uh, Tadashev, who was subsequently uh, was killed by the Boston FBI down in Florida. If those murders had instead been solved and focused on, there's an argument to be made that, in fact, that would have been a better use of resources solving homicides than doing surveillance as a way to stop a terrorist attack. And right now, the United States has a very bad clearance rate with regard to things like homicides. Only about one third are solved, and in Boston it's even lower. So I would submit that there are many things we can do to keep us safe, but I don't think we should be lulled into a false sense of security that merely having a huge haystack and putting more and more hay on the stack is gonna help us to find the needle of the bad guys in the haystack. Juliet, so I'll just say uh, three things. I mean, I agree with Jamie. I agree with uh, Jamie, you know, for, uh, I have three kids and anyone with kids, I'm a member of nothing except for Amazon.com, which is my favorite club to belong to, Amazon Prime. Um, it is different when Amazon tells me my kids need new socks and if I got an email from the NSA to tell me that, I, that my kids need new socks. That, that, I mean, that there is just a, a, a sense that I think, even though I give everything to Amazon Prime because they, they, they tell me when the boys need new socks. So I do believe in that distinction and I don't think we've made it clear enough in, in the law. But I, Two things, and Carol, I think you are right that one of the challenges of counterterrorism, and I think that's the title of this uh, panel, is it tends to make us think about one specific threat. And what I have written a lot about, and what I think is some of the changes within both the counterterrorism and the public safety entities, and, and I obviously you say not perfect, is the switch from just going to one risk to sort of all hazards or all risk. And that's just a, a tremendous shift in the narrative so that when you think about the Boston Police Department, whatever happened, that the tools necessary to stop the crime are, it doesn't matter what the crime is, right? And then when you actually think on the other side, when the bad thing happens, like the Boston Marathon, that to the police officer on the street, they don't care at that moment whether it was two brothers who were radicalized or 19 guys from Saudi Arabia or a generator under the street. At that moment, what they need to focus on is on saving lives. And so what you've seen over the course of these 12 years with a, obviously a lot of move towards covert is also a shift in particular the homeland where I worked in, in um, viewing terrorism as one of many. And that, that's gonna take a long time because we had six or seven years of building up a, 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 a counterterrorism apparatus and it needs to, we need to realize that it's all crimes, right? Whatever bad can happen, it's the same tools, which is community policing, all the things that you and I promote. Finally, um, what I wanna say about oversight on covert wars and surveillance is, um, is, is that we need more of it. I thought that the president coming out later to discuss how the NSA surveillance program would have oversight was, I, I just can't imagine that anyone would think that that wasn't necessary at the get-go. Um, but I want everyone to think about it in terms of law, which is um, the law authorizes and it also restricts. That's what we learn. And um, the and 
there's a, a line that someone told me actually when um, uh, Jane and I were on the National Commission on Terrorism that has stuck with me forever because it was at a time when there were lots of questions about um, ending the assassination ban by the CIA, which had come in after the church hearings when we realized we were trying to kill Castro and everyone and there was a ban. And I talked to an old CIA agent, I go, you know, given the nature of things now, like, do you think about changing that rule, which was sort of golden at the time, that you would never even think of removing the assassination ban? He said, it has had such a, um, uh, a sort of impact on the agents out in the field, right? That that's how you want to think about it, that, that the rules and the regulations, even if sometimes violated, even if accepted by a FISA court or whatever, that the rule of prohibition, um, when you actually think about it going out to all the agencies and all the intelligence agents, um, has a very, very good impact in terms of regulating um, um, our agents out in the field who honestly we're going to throw under the bus if they violate the line, right? So, so just one way to think about the surveillance issues is, um, is th there's laws authorizing it. We have to be as strong on the laws uh, of what the rules of oversight and disclosure are, not simply for the American public, but I actually think for the people working in the field who don't, if they don't know the ground rules, they're either gonna cross the line or not go far enough. That's just, it's, that's the basic rule, so. So, so I'm gonna uh, ask the two who haven't responded to my questions if they want to, and if we have a little bit of time, open it up. So we're used to thinking about the concepts of security, liberty, and privacy as intention, that we have to balance them. They are juxtaposed one against the other. But increasingly in our world, they're not. They live in uh, what in our book with Ben Wittes we're going to call the hostile symbiosis, where sometimes they are intention, like in airport security, where you're uh, giving up some of your privacy in exchange for enhanced security. And sometimes they really enhance each other. So when you have good, a good password on your computer, it enhances both your privacy and your security. And it's increasingly difficult to think about these things as merely offsetting one another. If you believe, as we do, that the rise of new technologies, the cyber technology, robotics, people mentioned drones, we're not just talking about predator drones in Pakistan, we're talking about technology that's available now on the free market for each of you. You go online, you can purchase a little drone. Uh, Amazon. On Amazon Prime, I'm sure it can uh, offer you that. <laughs> Some of them already have surveillance capacity. In the future, they'll have lethal capacity as well. Um, or you think about 3D printers where you can print a gun in your basement now, and those are actually functional. Uh, you think about bio platforms of uh, bioengineering, gene synthesis and sequencing that are increasingly available uh, at a lower cost with lower expertise needed in order to uh, put them to use. That creates what we call a world of many-to-many -many threats, a world of many-to-many -many threats that makes potentially every individual potentially threatening to any other individual anywhere around the globe. And that moves us to a world of policing, uh, where we have to police individuals everywhere, and surveillance is going to have to be a tool in the toolkit of how we do it. Now, the big problem is the unknowns. We have no idea how big of a threat that is. We, I actually, people on the panel here probably do have, I don't know how big of the government intrusion a threat to our privacy or liberty is. One interesting thing about privacy, almost 40 years ago, Judith Jardith uh, uh, Thompson, uh, the philosopher, said the striking thing about the right to privacy is that nobody has a clear sense of what it means. Uh, so we sort of group lots of things under the heading of privacy. It's not clear what exactly we mean. The one thing, because there are so many unknowns here, the one thing that as lawyers we often do when we have sort of incommensurate values that we don't know how to reconcile is focus on process. And forever else Snowden, you, you think about Snowden, he did prompt a very important conversation about who guards the guards. Uh, if we think we need surveillance, as I, I do, uh, we might be using it too much. Carol may be right about this. I don't know. What is clear is that there needs to be a careful process that looks, that involves more stakeholders, that takes a closer look at how these policies are put in place. And more importantly, 
how we backtrack. In national security, in general, in counterterrorism, we're very good at adding on security measures. We're not very good at taking them back. Nobody wants to take the risk of ratcheting down, and that's as much as, as important as ratcheting up. We also need the power to ratchet down. Yeah, thanks. Just very quickly um, on the surveillance issue. I mean, I'm an Iranian American who spends most of my day on the phone with people in this and other countries talking about terrorists. So I think a lot. Uh, I know. Yeah, you, we, you read it already. <laughs> <laughs> See? Just solved that right there on this panel. Yeah. Um, so I think that, I think exactly. I just want to follow, I guess, with what Gabby is saying. I don't know what the right balance is. I don't know whether surveillance is much more than we need or too little. But I do think that we don't just need Snowden or WikiLeaks, just a dump into the public space. We need a thoughtful public discussion on this issue. We need Americans to have discussions like the one we're having in this room. And I think that's what's missing when we have this idea that, well, now we have access to these leaks. What do we do with that knowledge? What do we do with these questions? Um, and what are, how do we even create a process for thinking through these things as citizens, as people, as consumers, and of these um, various access to information. And I just wanted to say on the um, drones covert issue, I think this has been um, one of the most vexing questions for international lawyers who work in national security since 9-11. There's this story in the early um, Bush era, the discussion within the CIA of torture and um, of someone saying to one of the lawyers, you know, we want chalk on our cleats. We want to push it to the very last step. And as lawyers, how do you manage that? You know, how do you give good counsel, honor where you are in the system and your obligations as a lawyer to your client, um, and also feel that you are a moral actor and that you are um, giving answers that, that you can feel good about um, once you are, have completed your post. And I think those are really hard questions we're still grappling with. Well, law is now inextricably tied in with each of the things that we're talking about. When you have the lawyers sitting next to uh, the site selector for bombing, I mean, it's a different kind of world than we used to have now, and understandably so, because security risks are different and our responses to them are different. Um, I, I'd like to open it up for comment, question. Somebody have a question, please, and say who you are. You didn't hear that. So uh, th this is a, a, a former Army JAG who actually performed the role of uh, giving the advice to the site selectors about what's on your left, what's on your right, and th the people uh, in that other chair appreciated that legal advice. And I do think that the military, uh, the U.S. military has enormous regard for, for law, and it's really integrated into the operations. When I um, teach our veterans, they know um, the rules of engagement, they know the international law rules, and they teach our, the rest of the students. So most of the leaks that have occurred, most of them have actually occurred from people who are governmental employees rather than contractors. So the, I would say the risks are the same and across the community, whether it is inside or outside, and it's just very hard to prevent the odd person, and with emphasis on odd, <laughs> uh, from, from, from leaking. Um, one of the interesting things that the NSA did a number of years ago was it decided to hire non-traditional people, hackers in essence, to come in and work for them. 
geeky people who often had very few social skills, often had no um, uh, higher level education, but were damn good with computers. And so if you say, God, how could you hire somebody who's so as weird as Snowden? Well, if you ask the head of the NSA or the former head of the NSA, if Snowden in his appearance was aberrational to the people they've hired? The answer would be no. Yeah. Can I just add one thing there? Um, one of the reasons that 9-11 happened was our government was stovepiped. And the FBI didn't actually talk to itself, let alone the CIA, and that has led to an effort to change the culture from need to know to need to share. And the reason that uh, the WikiLeaks uh, leak happened is all of our diplomatic traffic was now converged and it was pretty easy for a disaffected military kid to have access to it. That's been corrected to some extent. We don't want to go back to stovepipes, but we've got to go back to more compartmentalizing. And in the case of Snowden, uh, again, these systems analysts, there are only a thousand of them across the government, some are in contractors, some work for the government, have extraordinary access and obviously there's going to be a correction here to uh, instituting, they, they call it the two-man rule, I would call it the two-woman rule, because I think women are more responsive, never mind. But uh, <laughs> so, since when is a woman analyst leaked information? <laughs> but, but at any rate, there, the system does have to correct for this. Uh, the questions now are, are rife, but we, I'm being told we have to end, and so I'm going to do that. I, I, I do that, though, saying that you should read the New Republic's recent article by Jane Harmon on security and liberty should reinforce each other if done right. You should read Gabby Blum's uh, forthcoming book. You should read Carol's blog. You should uh, read Nas's work. You should try to talk to Jamie because she knows everything. And you should thank everybody. Thank everybody on this wonderful panel. Thank you.